Welcome to the Truth in This Art Beyond. And we're back in, in New Orleans, the Big Easy. And I am your host, Rob Lee. I've, I've been calling myself the Big Easy, by the way. You're calling yourself the Big Easy? I have been calling myself the Big Easy. Well, there you go. Let's, is that just to like attract women, or what is it going on there? It, it might be. I mean, I had a New Orleans alias, Robard Delacroix. That does, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, today, I'm excited to be in conversation with my next guest, uh, the creative director at Where Yet Magazine. Where Yet Magazine. Um, New Orleans free entertainment magazine that provides the latest news on entertainment, dining, life, nightlife and music, please welcome Robert Witkowski. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Oh, it's, it's exciting to be here. I've, you've got a lot going on, and I'm certainly in good company with some of your other guests. I'm, I'm trying. Trying to be somebody. <laughs> that's, that's always the way I put it. And people say, you need to stop saying trying. I was like, eh. But as we start off, I want to do sort of this softball introductory. I gave the copy and paste sort of interview, um, introduction. Um, I want to like open it up for you to share like a bit of your background and maybe what were some of your early creative influences? Because when you have within your title creative, you have to have creative influences. So I'd like to you know kind of like set that stage, give us the origin story a bit. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I mean the. Origin story, if you will, is me at three years old incessantly drawing on anything I could find from walls to scratch papers to anything. Um, and that was what I did. And everyone basically kept saying, well, he's going to be an artist, he's going to be an artist. And not knowing what an artist was, I just kept drawing. And as my life continued, I wound up pursuing um, an illustration degree at the University of Delaware, not very far from Baltimore, and uh, basically kind of went into that storytelling visuals uh, along the way. Uh, from that point, I you know, basically expanded into doing logo designs and all sorts of like cartoons. But cartooning was primarily my start. I sort of always envisioned myself as a political cartoonist way back in the day. Uh, some of my early influences, I think one of the things that resonates the strongest with me was the uh, uh, record cover, the album cover for the Boston album with the spaceship. Nice. I think so a lot of people are probably rolling their eyes going, oh yeah, I remember that one. Uh, that one, for some reason, just engaged me on levels I can't even explain. And it was sort of ironic that I wound up living in Boston for a number of years. But the, uh, that was a big one. And then, of course, in terms of cartooning, uh, Burke Brethed uh, was huge with Bloom County. And, of course, Doonesbury was a big influence. And then and Calvin and Hobbes. Those were all really, uh, they told a story, but they also presented a, a sort of a relatable humanity that everyone uh, could could identify with. And I just thought that was really just great. Um, growing up in the New York City area, every Sunday morning, I could not wait to see what the new Hirschfeld drawing was uh, in the theater uh, theater section. And so I, I've, had, I've gotten, uh, big, the big moment in my life was when I was able to go and actually purchase a Hirschfeld from the Margot Feiden Gallery in the Upper East Side, and I could actually have my own. <laughs> so that was a, that was a big deal. Uh, I did actually toy with going to um, get a master's in illustration uh, at SVA, and I was hoping to work with Ralph Steadman, who, with uh, anyone who's familiar with the Hunter Thompson books and and some of the wine bottles out there now, uh, his kinetic energy and the way that he expressed uh, was sort of uh, Al Hirschfeld on steroids and just just out of control and those were really really huge influences for me growing you know growing up and getting into into the career uh, but then as things evolved um, I've always been able to sort of parlay my illustration abilities into uh, working as graphic designer and and you know lead artists in a lot of different um, industries so I've been in the garment industry the education industry the publishing industry um, business to business, uh, and actually automotive as well. It's been kind of a, a wild ride. So it's weird because I've never really been in the same industry twice, but I've never ultimately done anything a whole lot different than I've ever done. But it's there's always new challenges, and I think that's the biggest part of the creativity is finding a way to communicate with people on a universal level, much like those early cartoons, yeah. 
but being able to do it in any industry and find a way to to connect with with the people that you'll never meet. That that is that's, that's huge and. You know, listening to such a, a, a varied career, but also of like a kind of unified through line sensibility thing within the career, you know, I, I have to ask this, like if there was a, a stop within that path, whether it was automotive period, whether it was a bad, is there a stop that you, you look back on, you're like, yeah, I remark and look at and experience there even now with what you're doing. like. Yeah, that was very formative for me, this stop at this point in my career. Um, and if there is one, what would it be and what, what did you like, like take from it? I mean, I think they all had um, elements that I use every day. And I don't think it was a stop in a particular industry or anything I was doing, although I've, I've really identified and fall in love with publishing. I do, you know, I worked for Portland Magazine. Uh, up in Maine, and I'm obviously at where you at now in New Orleans and stuff. And and I was a TV guide for freelancing for a number of years. And there's just something about the consistency of, of uh, and the activity of publishing. I mean, there's a reason that publishing is you know, Double War Prada and all these different <laughs> you know all these different TV shows, Ugly Betty and stuff. Publishing is just is just it's got a mystique that's undefinable but in reality it's like any job it's a lot of work and and the payoff but there that finished product is still really satisfying and seeing people react to it and i think like any creative person any artist in any discipline i don't care if you're a chef a writer anything if when you see people uh, out in the world physically enjoying reading you know basically validating what you did was something that they're mm. appreciating and enjoying. That's that's the goal. I mean, so many creatives, it's not about the not about the money. I mean, it's obviously important because you want to keep going, but it's really just about people coming up and, and just you see their response, their enjoyment of something, filmmakers, etc. I think one of the goofiest moments that my daughters rolled their eyes at was we went from New York City, we went up to go see a basketball game uh, in Boston where we had lived for a number of years and there were people in the stands still wearing the sport shirts that I had designed, cartoon <laughs> shirts like Cam Neely and, and various players and I was just like, I did that shirt. They're like, Dad, shut up. You're very <laughs> But I was so excited about just that that was even still popular enough that people were still wearing it years later. It's crazy. I, I, I can agree to, to the, the sense in doing this when um, like I record a lot of interviews in batch, right? So it's just like I have a sense of when I'm going to put something out, but you know, if I'm curating something or I have to start using that terminology because that's what it is. Um, if I'm going through and it's like I did this interview, I have this sort of month of interviews that I'm doing that are related to, let's say, photographers. And it's like, well, I did this like a few months ago, and I'm, I'm, it's out of the data bank. It's like I'm not actively working on it. So when it releases and it goes out and it gets to the, the sort of response, people's like, yeah, man, I can't believe you talked to that dude about this. That rapid fire question was real funny. And I was like, <laughs> I don't remember any of that. What are you saying? And the, the number of interviews have gotten so high at this point. It's like I remember most of them. I remember at least what was said and having the sense of, you know, how it went, but if it wasn't like this, like person to person, this is sort of a different thing. And when I encounter the people in public, like being in the same circles, they're like, hey man, this was a really impactful experience. Or I'll have people tell me, this is my first podcast, man. Now I'm doing my own podcast now. And it's like, wow, this is, this is really cool. And this, and this sort of slice of what I'm doing, I suppose. And, um, and I remember even like now, right? I'm, you know, providing direction for folks um, and being partners with different people. Like, you know, I had a coffee hour right now and that's a really cool thing because I kind of shot my shot. And people were like, man, your coffee is doing really good. I was like, my coffee. <laughs> I was like, wow. It's like, yeah, it's got your picture on there. I was like, wow, this is something. <laughs> and not knowing what to do with it, but it is really cool sort of to get that feedback and feel like people are listening, people are consuming. It's like, people like this creative thing that was me shooting my shot. Right, exactly. And, 
you know, more than that, they're responding to it and it resonates with them in such a way that they're they're giving you the feedback of yeah. positivity and how it, that worked out. Oftentimes, people are negative feedback comes back pretty rapidly. <laughs> the like, positive <laughs> feedback's a little few and far between, but it's, it's nice like, when it happens. It's like, here's my take. Here's the notes. Everything sucks. It's like, why are you an editor now? What, what is this? <laughs> um, so you, you, you mentioned illustration. You mentioned design. So talk about, like, when that interest kind of like peaked for the in creative direction and like what does a creative director do because I've only interviewed two well I, you know I think every like a lot of jobs the creative director and their role and responsibilities is going to differ not only in the organization they're in but also the industry and of course what their personal uh, take and contributions are going to be but from my perspective um, the creative director is basically sort of overlooking and protecting the brand identity. It's going to be making it, you know, getting things out there in a way that people can look at something and recognize mm -hmm. it as being part of that brand, even if they don't like see the brand identity logo or whatever. Um, you know, the other side of that is you want to be able to sort of make sure that anything that's coming out of that organization or even as vendors or freelancers are also going forward with that same voice, that same branding, that same feel. Otherwise, it looks very disjointed and, and uncoordinated. Uh, I mean, the most simplistic way of saying it is creative directors, the head chef, mm -hmm. and the sous chef and all the line cooks and everything else have to prepare in that, in that same manner to represent the restaurant you know, authentically and consistently. So when did that become an interest for you? Um, well, I've been fortunate enough that I've, also, I've always been able to maintain a level of being a hands-on creative director, and I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there are creative directors certainly out there who are, you know, a corporate head chef, if you will, where <laughs> they're not in the weeds anymore and they're not necessarily you know, drawing or putting things together, or maybe not even comping things. They're just sort of putting out a, a, an edict. And that can be good management. So in some ways, a creative director doesn't even have to be creative. Uh, but in terms of someone uh, who's in a more nimble organization, that they can get in there and they're still really calling the shots and having a lot of creative uh, authority and identity, um, you know, it was a nice bridge for me because it was a way that I could sort of get the voice out there and convey ideas, but also in a way tutor and, and bring people along who are looking to achieve that. We've had uh, been very fortunate to oversee several uh, internship programs, including where he at's uh, over my career, and I still have people coming back who've flourished and thrived in different you know organizations and and creative you know roles and careers and who'll come back and, and share that with me or you see them in social media and stuff and and that's just that's really rewarding in so many ways thank you thank you um, I feel like I'm you know sitting at the knowledge tree right now <laughs> you know don't, don't get don't get tight if I start emailing you like look I got an idea what do you think and but I, but I, I see like and I, and I have a sense of like my background was in marketing you know starting off and you know, as a kid, I wanted to be an illustrator. It was one of those things, and I did painting and writing and all of that different stuff. And ultimately, this became the the, the medium, I guess, I wanted to stick with, and that I've um, I call it my most stable relationship. There you go. And longest term, it's 14 years in. We're going strong. Anniversary <laughs> coming up. Well, I actually, just passed. I forgot. Sorry, podcast. But uh, <laughs> but I, I think I, I, I see that like having a sort of sense when you mentioned like brand identity and protecting that and kind of making sure just when people say is this on brand does this make sense i i try to do that and definitely in having conversations with folks i'm like does this fit why does this fit and even being more curated and more meticulous in that now where folks will reach out i would love to be in your podcast i'm like that's cool it's like which information I'm trying to do that sort of weeding out process will this fit and that's the thing I'm always looking at. Does this fit on what I see this sort of brand is, this version of facilitated storytelling, this version of journalism, this version of podcasting, if you will. And there have been some instances over the last, let's say, year that they, they don't fit. And I'm being very, very curated in how I'm approaching it. Whereas, like, 
you know, in the past, it might be, oh, okay, you fit because of this. And maybe that has shifted because my interests have shifted a little bit to the still, still me, still same sense, sensibilities, same sort of storytelling. But I'm very interested in cultural preservation, not just, oh, you, you paint something really cool. That's great. What else is under it? What are the, what are the other things there? What, does this make for a good conversation? And, and so on. Yeah, no, I think that's extraordinarily important because, you know, you'll see, you know, and, and people can probably point to different things, uh, whether it's TV shows, movies, magazines, restaurants, where the creative person, whether it's, the, again, the head chef, the creative director, uh, a writer, perhaps, when that shifts, there's usually a very, very palatable change like you'll either notice the entire magazine got redesigned yeah. or the menu in the restaurant changes or the writing style is all of a sudden you know either better or worse than your, what you had thought previously so there's there there's definitely that and that's the important piece for someone like yourself doing a podcast or myself at the magazine you're going to go forward with your voice and your creativity and it's extraordinarily important that the culture and the the messaging, if you will, uh, of that organization, that place, that whatever, is in line, mm -hmm. uh, and more importantly, that you're in line with it. Uh, being your own podcast, it's what you needed and wanted to be. But as you're saying, you're sort of, you know, fostering it and cultivating it as you go along. Uh, you know, some people are extraordinarily talented, and they can walk into any situation and tailor their creativity and their painting styles or, or whatever their, their voice is to what's in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some people that could probably do a great job at, and, uh, you know, music company, you know, mm -hmm. do designing, you know, the visuals that are gonna go on streaming platforms and, and different things, but can they go to Snowboard Magazine and do the same thing? Do they even want to? Right. You know, and vice versa. So, you know, you really just have to find something, you know, that you love and that you that resonates with you. If you, you know, like anything, if you have a job that you're terrible at, you're a lawyer and you don't want to be a lawyer, you're going to be a terrible lawyer. Um, you know, you're going to be an artist and you want to be an artist. But what do you want to be an artist about? What do you want to be a creative person aligned with do you like music or do you hate music do you you know would any would anyone i remember one time i'm telling tales out of school now my brother <laughs> i'm in new orleans now i love new orleans been trying to get down here for you know decades and i finally made it happen but i remember the first time my brother who lives in chicago wanted to come down to new orleans and i told him i said you got to go it's the most amazing city you're gonna have a great time and he went i called him up afterwards and i said hey how was it Did you have a great time because that was the worst trip of my life and i said why he goes here's a little hint don't go to New Orleans with, well, how did he say it? I'm going to mess it up now. Don't go to New Orleans with non-drinking vegetarians who don't like jazz. <laughs> and I said, that sounds like the seventh level of hell. And he goes, it really kind of was. And so, unfortunately, you know, he wasn't one of them, but he was with them. And that was sort of, you know, miserable adjacent. It's, it's funny. Um, and thank you for sharing. That was really funny because... When I, the, when I came down here, I came down with my partner, and she's, she's a pescatarian. So we at least got that, and she came down. She's like, no, 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 I went to school in Atlanta, so I know I'm gonna be using meat points in New Orleans. And she was like, you know, even the vegetables are in pork juice, so that's what I'm having. And I remember we went to Toops, and she had like the meat platter. I was like, "Oh, you're you're living reckless right now." <laughs> and she was like, "Look, man, it's protein." I was like, "You, you're great." And you know, we we love live music, and really being able to come down down here and, and experience it, and just again, you know, as I was touching on a little bit earlier, and in, in doing this podcast and, and speaking to some of the folks I'm speaking to, I'm seeing it in a much different way now. Yeah. So let, let's talk about the magazine a little bit. Um, in terms of mission, right? Is, is it, is, does the magazine have a mission? Like, you know, speak on that a little bit. And what is the mission? And maybe like how 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 creative direction here maybe differ from some of the roles and responsibilities you, you've had previously that led to where you're at now. Well, I would never presume to speak to Mission uh, without <laughs> consulting with the publisher. Uh, he is the founding publisher. We're in our 25th year, yeah. and it is going 
strong. We actually had one of our best years ever, and we recently had our uh, Mardi Gras issue put out the largest issue we've ever put out in 25 years. So to all of that, whatever the mission is, has been working. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, if I was going to uh, be as so bold, I would say that the mission of this publication is really to, you know, present New Orleans uh, life, culture, music, and food uh, in the, the most fun and, and, you know, informative way to not only visitors, but locals. And, you know, a lot of our readership is uh, students who are kind of a combination of both. They're kind of semi-local, but they're also visiting and, you know, still consider, you know, their various New York, New Jersey, wherever they're coming down from, uh, home. But they also want to be connected. And I think, you know, it's interesting. There's been a lot of talk about print being dead. Uh, we are not necessarily um, seeing that. And we're, like I said, going strong with a huge circulation uh, in print. But we also obviously have a really great, strong digital footprint with uh, the website and various social media. So, you know, I think part of it may be just embracing that and running with it. But there's still a lot of people who like picking up and getting that tangible piece of paper to review and read. Um, particularly with now with Jazz Fest coming up right now. I'm probably dating your podcast, but wow. Jazz Fest starts in a couple of weeks and it's going to go on and, and having those uh, those cubes of all the schedules of all the performers over all the days is, is you can't keep up. So it's just good to have that handy and you don't want to be bringing out your phone every 10 seconds. <laughs> so that's been good. Um, but yeah, there is something that is really unique about this city that makes a publication like this really important. And you see that in a lot of cities. I mean, the one thing that's kind of interesting with the, the way that publications and print publications particularly are going is that publications that are urban-based and actually bring a perspective that locals would like or that has enough of a unique identity that people want to relate to it or look back at it seem to have a really nice niche that is, I won't say bulletproof, but it's sustaining a lot better than other other genres right. in terms of print and things. So that's kind of interesting in itself. The other piece of it that makes this publication, I think, is excessively nice. You had the Village Voice in New York. You had the Phoenix in Boston. Uh, you know, you had the Improper Bostonian in Boston, and you have a lot of different other music lifestyle publications that have gone by the way of the dinosaurs. But New Orleans just lives and breathes this stuff like nobody's business. And the fact that the publisher, you know, basically started this, uh, you know, at the very early time of when this was really picking up to, to sort of new levels in terms of interest of, you know, not only students, but just tourism and things like that as well. I mean, he, he's really been pretty brilliant in riding the wave and knowing what works and what doesn't work and, and keeping that sort of, again, for the brand, consistent yeah. and enjoyable for everybody. That's, that's sweet. I, I, I'm really into it. And I do have that uh, Jazz Fest issue. I grabbed it this morning when I went to get a coffee and I was like, all right, I kind of should have this in my hand today. Right? <laughs> you know, and I, I think, yeah, like when I go to different cities, that's the thing I'm getting. What's the accessible thing? And then all of them are not on the same you know curve obviously it's like oh, this is nothing in here or it's nothing but ads in here or what have you and that is not the case with your magazine well thank you yeah we try to make sure that there's a a really good balance of advertising because obviously advertising pays the bills uh, a lot of people don't actually re realize this but the french definition of the word magazine is store mm. And so uh, right outside our offices here is Magazine Street, and it was just a street full of stores. And so the whole impetus of radio as well as, as magazine publications was putting ads out there, but you weren't going to get anyone to read the ads, as they've quickly found out, or listen to a radio show full of advertisements, unless you had something there to make them listen in between the ads. And it's sort of, everyone sort of thinks the ads are there in between the music, but really the music and, and the literature is in between the ads. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and that's, again, going to the other original point, that's why it's important to have a consistent and, and a voice that's aligned because you're not going to be looking at a car mechanic shop in vogue. Right. 
Mm -hmm. You know, Vogue's advertisers want to read about the high-end fashion line, and the people who are reading our publication want to read about the music and culture and food of New Orleans. Absolutely. And it's a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and I'll ask this, and this definitely ties. What are, what are some of those considerations that, that are made with, from, from your vantage point, or even if you want to peel the onion back further of the sort of unifying like, like message and approach, but what are some of those considerations that are made when it comes to like serving as a voice here of like, you know, I'm coming here, someone's visiting, it's like, what's the, what to do in New Orleans? Well, yeah, I'm gonna get this, mag get this magazine, I'm gonna check it out. What are some of those considerations that are made of, you know, covering maybe this area of what's coming up. I speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I think what's really uh, what's really been an interesting trend, and we're adapting and adjusting. But I think you have to do that anywhere in life. Is um, the interest in the immersive experience? So you know, there was a time where you and there was a book about it, a movie. Uh, about being an accidental tourist. When, when people left their home, they left Baltimore, right? They, they weren't sure what the food was gonna be like, you know, so they went to McDonald's or they went to, they went to the safe places that was homogenous and you, you just knew what you were getting and it was safe. And so there was a lot of that with travel. But then as things have gone on, particularly with the onset and, and proliferation of, you know, home away, Airbnb, uh, and all these different places of like, you want to be in there. You know, it's not about where do I go eat? It's where do you go eat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you want to, you don't want to go to the tourist trap. You want to go to where people, the, the locals are going because they're not telling anybody that you want to go there because they want to keep it to themselves. But if you ask them, they'll tell you. So it's that kind of balance. And then of course you have, again, with any destination, but New Orleans is, so I'd say more unique than others. You have a mystique, you have a reputation, you have sort of a people's mind's eye. So when they come here, you know they're thinking Bourbon Street, you know they're thinking hurricane drinks, you know they're thinking jazz music, and you know they're thinking, you know, probably, you know, wild women in the streets and things like that. But are they knowing about all of the world class museums and are they knowing about all of the you know the high rises that are here in the financial center that's here and then all of the the great neighborhoods that have all these wonderful little hidden treasures and that's the sensibility you want to meet the expectations of what's in their mind's eye without turning the city into a stereotype or a cartoon but you also don't want to you know condescend and be i guess overly coddling for people who live here and know all this already. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that new, that balance of new and interesting things that maybe aren't in the common knowledge. Like some people might be like, oh, I, I'm, I heard about that restaurant. Or sometimes it's even more important to say, hey, this is a new restaurant opening by the chef that you really know well. Then people, even locals, will be like, oh, I've been to that restaurant. And tourists might even be like, oh, I've, well, I've been to Toops. They're opening a new place. I gotta go check that out. Yeah. You know, and and that's where you know the information and and the fun gets there. But then, you know, every time that plane lands, every time there's a new Mardi Gras, every time there's a new jazz fest, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are walking into the city for the first time, and they need to know what to do. Yeah, I, I absolutely I, I dig it, and you know I'm always trying not to do the same thing each time. I'll say. And the, I think this is the sixth, sixth or seventh time I've been down here. The first time, noob. Stayed out there at the airport. I definitely had a hurricane. I definitely did a tour and all of that. And <clears throat> I feel like each time since, I've added something different. I've approached things in a different way. And I'll say in having some of the conversations, at least for these like last two uh, times I've been down and going out here to do interviews, I mentioned like I've talked to this person, this person, and then you have like some of the like the, the locals are like, oh, you actually talked to real people. You didn't talk to like Joe. This is the person you should be speaking with. You didn't put on like a bunch of beads and an alligator hat and just no. You 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 did different things and really invested and and I think the, the way that I approach it, there's a tourism angle that 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 comes in with doing these podcasts in different cities. I look at it as an invitation. I look at the podcast as a whole as an invitation, whether it's an invitation to learn more about the guests and their work, 
whether it's an invitation to learn more about the culture that's connected, whether it be the, the, the community that they're in or where they're from and so on, but it's an invitation. And I think when things are presented in that way, you're, you're inclined, you're going to definitely cover some of the stuff that people are familiar with. It's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's there. You know, the Jazz Museum, that's, that's the thing. You know, obviously it should be, right? And, oh, I'm going to have some, you know, pralings or pralings. I don't know how they pronounce it. Um, <laughs> you're going to do all of that, but also you're going to try some other things. And I, I would say the last time I was here, that was the first time I had um, roast beef po' boy, and it changed my life. And I was like, oh, oh this, is, this is delicious. And I was purely a fried shrimp po' boy. And I was just like, nah, 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 do it this way. Make sure it's dressed, the whole thing. And, you know, really going to those places that I didn't see on the travel show. Right. And connecting with people because you'll engage in a conversation and do something you weren't expecting. I, I think if you try to explore, and I think many of these things, publications, podcasts, what have you, are a way to at least start off that curiosity and help inform it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there's that that constant, you know, tightrope of people wanting to, you know, visit like a local. Uh, and then you still also have the locals who want to, you know, live like a tourist, mm -hmm. you know, because every now and again, there is that really lovely experience where you go out and maybe you haven't been out for a while because you've been working and so forth if you're a local and you go out and you just like see something fresh or you have oh my gosh i haven't done white linen night in several years and all of a sudden the whole city's new to you you know it's like that first sort of giddy holy cow I, I live here i can't believe i live here and then other people of course visiting they go to this down and dirty places, as they say, you know, in the city, the worse the place looks, the better the food. And so when you have that experience, you feel like you've got an inside track, you know, mm -hmm. you, you may be looking over your shoulders, not sure it's a safe area of town, but it's probably perfectly fine. And that's, and that's the lovely part about that. You know, I had a friend of mine uh, who's a very well-known chef in town and Michael Roos, and he wound up uh, telling me when I was coming down, he goes, just remember, you can't, you can't live here like you visit here. And that's, mm. that's, that's gospel right there. <laughs> that's, 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 that's really good. And uh, that's, I, I, I'll say, and I got two more real questions before we get to the rapid fire ones. Uh, I think, and I, and I mentioned this earlier um, in this, this sort of arc of interviews, uh, one of the early, the first time I came down here, I will say indirectly Hannibal Burris caused me to come down here his bit about New Orleans and all of that, that was like, I need to explore that. I need to see if he's right. And then I tur it turns out he was. I was like, oh, yep. <laughs> this is exactly what it is. And then in, in going to one of the places he mentioned, I was like, this is exactly what the thing is. And, you know, he's also an Aquarius. So I was, I was joking with my girl. I was like, I could never go down there. I'll just gamble and, and just have second lines every time. I was every like, time. I'm going to be broke. <laughs> I was like, I already have my DJ alias. I'm, I'm setting it up. She doesn't know that this is the strip it's about. Um, so talk about from, from your vantage point, right? You know, it's a monthly publication, right? It is. What sort does, of. <laughs> I, I usually ask people, what does a typical day look like? But, you know, in, in, in as broad as possible. Um, what does that month leading up to like the, the release look like for you? Well, it's interesting. Um, so we're a monthly, I have to preface by saying we're a monthly, uh, but we actually have 14 issues okay. because two of the biggest times of the year uh, are happily six months apart or I'd probably die. So uh, one is we have our October issue, two weeks later we have our Halloween issue, and two weeks later we have our November issue. Oof. And right now we're in a similar cycle where we had uh, our April, um, our April issue, and then midway through April, we've had our Jazz Fest first weekend issue, and we're going to press uh, a week and a half later with our Jazz Fest weekend two issue, which is also May. So in May, I get to relax a little bit, but up until then, it's just a little bit of a of a hamster wheel. But it's fun, and again, it's that satisfaction of getting it done and making it look great, and having people, especially thousands of people at Jazz Fest. You know, they go walking around with it. It's a, a feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction. Uh, but in terms of the general question, um, you know, it's probably a lot like about a lot of publications. You're ramping up. You, you know, we do our pitches with our writers uh, quarterly. We're ahead of that for a number of uh, months, so we have it hopefully edited by the time the issue closes. It's we have edited copy ready to go for the new issue. Um, you know, and then it's basically just gathering images, making sure we have all copyrights secured and, and you know, bulletproof. 
and then we go into layouts and you know advertising advertisers coming in uh, making sure they're all the correct ads and you know sometimes there's changes and then putting it all together on week three and then week four uh, upload. So it's it's a bit of a whirlwind, you know, especially when you have those four weeks and then when it's two weeks, then it's all compressed. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of running around. But, you know, and I, I say that somewhat jokingly, the, the reality is that you're, you know, when you have the two-week cycles, you're working on multiple publications at the same time. And that's where, you know, uh, and it's funny, I'm having conversations with my daughters right now, and, you know, there's those years in, in your early career where everything's terrible and life sucks and all that good stuff. But uh, my similar formative years working at TV Guide, back when we had a weekly publication, a monthly publication, a bi-weekly publication, and a national cable guide going out. Uh, on, on, on every, like every week, there was, but the weeks that all four closed at the same time was a nightmare. Um, but as horrible as that was in the moment, as much fun as I had in the moment, uh, it proved to be a very valuable training ground. It's great. It's great. Um, I, I try to think it. It's, it's a challenge, you know. Um, luckily, when there is multiple parts to it, you know, writers, photographers, people just. I'm, I'm one person. Yeah, I have an editor. I'm one person for the most part. So a lot of the stuff you're just like, does this fit the brand? Mm, creative director hat. You know, uh, what, where's this at on the schedule? Let me put this hat on. I was like, I and literally, I'm putting out episodes almost daily. Yeah. And so it's just like trying to be ahead of it. So spending that time in a very, very, very truncated sort of way of do I have copy for these show notes? Do I have an image? Is it approved image? And so on. Is it is the file edited? Does right. it sound good? And you know, it's a whole lot of how the sausage is made. Yep. And and you know, it's a lot that goes into anything that's going out there for eyes and ears to receive. Absolutely. And you know, and I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, that there's like chefs and restaurants who are as good as their last meal or their last service and advertising agencies that are living and dying on, on you know, the latest, you know, Delta ad or whatever, yeah. whoever's got that account today. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, anyone in that creative process, yourself, me, anyone out there, uh, and I'm talking about writing, music, movies, I mean, just Broadway theater. I mean, there's so much so much great entertainment and talent out there, but there's a reason that it is so coveted mm -hmm. because life without it doesn't, it's not worth living. I mean, you know, you talk about movie actors, oh my God, they're paid so much and, and pro athletes and things like that. You know, what are they doing? What is that job? It's, it's entertainment. But there's a lot of people who need that in their lives because they're working really hard too. But maybe they're not getting that creative outlet and they're not getting the enjoyment out of it that we're able to. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you need to reset to remember that and, and just understand how blessed we are to, to be doing what we're doing. Yeah, and, and I have one last question I'm gonna ask you, but I definitely wanna throw this comment in there. You know, when we look at, there's, I think real estate would be the term here, right? there's a minimal amount of real estate in terms of attention. So make sure your stuff is good. Yeah. Because you have social media, TikTok, all of the different things. You have a 90 million movies that come out and not all are gonna, you just don't have the time to check all, all of them at the same, you know, at the same time. And, you know, podcasts are very flooded. You know, <laughs> there's so many of them. And it's just like, people can do other things with their time. So having something that's gonna, develop sort of a, and, and, and cultivate and maintain a, an audience and the support, like just, you know, do that good stuff yeah. at the end of the day. No, I think it's an important point too. And, and to use the analogy again of, of chefs, I was fortunate enough to live in Portland, Maine when Bon Appetit named it Restaurant City of the Year for the entire country, oh. which was pretty amazing. And Portland, Maine's 65,000 people. It's not a big, like, huge city. It's the biggest city in Maine, but it's it's a pretty compact town. Uh, but a proliferation of amazing James Beard Awarding restaurants. It's yeah. unbelievable. And, you know, you take someplace like New Orleans or New York or even Baltimore, and they're big enough that a restaurant can get lost in the shuffle. You know, someone goes... That's terrible, they leave, but someone else is gonna come. When you've got a, a, a small market like that, mm -hmm. it's gotta perform. And more importantly, 
a restaurant is not going to survive. It's going to survive on tourism, but in the off season, it is not going to bring the locals in to sustain it through in main situation of, of winter, yeah. unless those locals are supporting it. And if you're going to survive, you need to be good. You need to be great. You know, you can't be good. You have to be great. And and all those restaurants are still really thriving even after the pandemic. So um, there's a lot of talented chefs out there. There's a lot of creativity out there. A lot of innovation. A lot of really great food. And you're going to find that in a place like New Orleans. And you know, certainly there's enough restaurants around. But you talk about a flooded media market. Yeah. You know. And again, this publication has been around. You know, Josh Danzig founded it back. 25 years ago, and it's having its best year in its history. So, what does that say? It's, it's you know, it's great. Proud to be part of it. It's wonderful. So, I, I, I asked this. I, I asked this of the previous uh, creative director I interviewed. So, I got to ask you: What are uh, two to three tools that you use to like, you know, that you're always in? Whether it be the apps that you have open, what for you to do what you do, and as many things you mentioned the hamster wheel earlier, right? How, is a hamster wheel one of them? How do you, you know, keep keep it all like kind of sorted? What are those apps that you use? Those tools that you use to keep your your stuff organized and you on point to do your to do your work? Wow, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, obviously, you need some kind of a, a calendar system just to you know follow dates and figure out when things are at. Um, there's a really great. A uh, program that I was uh, introduced two years ago that I personally find helpful uh, called Team Up. It's typically free, uh, and you can have up to five or maybe even ten uh, participants on it. And it's a whole you know workflow management thing that you can do, but it also keeps your your timing. And and you know if that doesn't work for you, then there's always you know the Google. I think Google in general with their calendar and their email and various other things uh, is is pretty. You know, for a low entry cost and a high performance, I think you can even do a Google phone on it. So there's so many different things that Google can get you through and communications, and you don't even have to pay the money on a lot of programs. You could use Google Docs to yeah. deal with Word and Excel and all these things. So I think those are those are definitely key. But from my perspective, um, the whole thing falls apart without InDesign. I'm feeling seeing a very um, disturbing trend uh, that a lot of people are uh, coming out of art school and they know Illustrator and Adobe and they know Photoshop and Adobe, but they are not being taught in design. They're being thrown to Canvas, which Ooh. is fine on a digital world, but it's a very sh it, that is a short-sighted recipe for disaster. That you're leaving a lot of. I think it's a huge disservice. I think they're leaving a lot of students out in the world who are going to not be able to do anything with their lives. Um, now, is Canva going to be great? And if they're just going to do digital, yeah, I'm not saying they can't do a lot of really great things with it. Okay. But if you're talking about being a serious designer and doing things going forward, I find that to be really, really dangerous. And more importantly, if I want to hire someone and they're going to come at me and with their resume and say that they know Canvas and they've never played on InDesign or they don't like it, they're not getting hired. And I have to think there's a whole bunch of ad agencies and other, you know, serious you know, creative companies out there that are going to have the same issues. I mean, I come from the publisher background with Microsoft back in the day. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me Quark. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Um, so now I've been adding rapid fire questions. Oh dear. I've been talking. Here we go. So you know how this works. Don't overthink them, you know. Uh, so I got six of them for you. Mm. Okay, that's easy. I can handle that. All right, uh, so here's the first one. What is your favorite springtime activity? Oh, well, Mardi Gras. That's good. Uh, I told you I was going to ask you this earlier, but I shifted it. Favorite New Orleans food? Like, if there was the one. Char grilled oysters. See, you're doing well. Um, if, someone, if someone were to visit New Orleans for 36 hours, what are three things that they must do? Oh, that's easy, because I do that all the time. <laughs> Um, so, the, okay, so I think they have to go to the French Quarter, they have to have a beignet at Café du Monde, nice. uh, and that's sort of the same thing, so we'll, we'll put that one together. Um, I think the Sculpture Garden of the Art Museum is a, definitely a must-do, and they have to somehow get on the water on the Mississippi, uh, particularly if they've never seen the Mississippi before. So whether that's a ferry ride or a paddle wheeler or 
you know, a kayak, it doesn't matter. They just, they should, they should get on the Mississippi. I did that actually on my birthday last time. There you I, go. I got on, I was like, uh, we were trying to get on Natchez. And I was like, that's not going to happen. We got on one of the other ones. And I was like, yo, it is cold. Where, it, why didn't I bring a jacket? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's absolutely dope. Um, um, can, I, can I add one more? Please, please, please. So uh, definitely, and top of the list to be fair, uh, go see live jazz somewhere. You can walk the streets and, and you can walk from block to block and never not hear music. One will fade out, another one will fade in and stuff. Um, Bourbon Street's certainly got enough talent on it, although it can be amateur night for some tourists and stuff. But uh, if you really want the real deal, Frenchman Street in the Marigny, that's where you go. That's great. It's great. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's like the soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Tell completely. Um, name a superpower you would like to try out for 24 hours. I would have to go with the uh, invisible thing. It's great. It's great. Now, this one is a little trolly, and it's a little bit of punny, but it's going to work. So Philly has this idea of, like, wit or without key. Wit or without, right? They do. Uh, so, you know, and it's within their, their major sandwich, their, their culinary contribution. I, I always go wit, just for the record. So you get it. Yeah. Uh, does Noya have that? Does New Orleans have that? And what is that? I have an answer, but I want to see what your take is. Dressed or undressed. See, you got it. Done, yeah, done. po' boys. There's a dressed or absolutely. <laughs> so that's it. That's, that's the podcast. Oh, that was, that was easy. See? Yeah. I, I, mean, maybe. I, I always amp it up like, man, you never know what's going to happen on the rapid fire portion. There you go. And then it's just like a bunch of softballs, but it has nothing to do with the work. All right. So here's a question for you, Mr. Spin rapid it. fire. Spin it. Phillips? Oh, oh. I make my own. Oh, see, that's even better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I smoke my crab cakes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'll, nice. I'll, I'll tell you about them in a bit. That'd be good. Um, so, um, one, I want to thank you for coming on to this podcast. This has been just oh, it was a lot of fun. Chef kiss. Uh, and two, I want to invite and encourage you to uh, share with the listeners um, anything you want to share in the final moments, preferably social media, website, all of that good stuff where folks can follow and learn more. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, number one, come to New Orleans. It's a great city. Uh, where Yat Magazine is whereyat.com, W-H-E-R-E-Y-A-T.com. Uh, there have obviously our website, but you can also see the printed version digitally online for free. You can even download it if you care to, to have a print version from afar. Uh, for anyone who wants to have the tangible print version, you can also do a subscription. We charge for the mailing, but not for the publication. That aside, social media, uh, pretty much across the board, at Where Yat NOLA. So whether you're doing Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or anything else, but you want to be on the cutting edge of the latest bands coming out, people doing things. Our music calendar is very robust, and uh, yeah, we, we try to be on the ground floor and everything and get it out there as quick as we can. Thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Robert Murkowski from Way Yet Magazine for coming onto the podcast, and I'm Rob Lee, and saying that there's art and culture in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Thank you.